Hello and welcome back to Film Exaggeration. Let's go back to 2003. It was a very challenging year for a lot of people. The US war in Iraq started despite massive protests, the space shuttle Columbia disintegrated on re-entry killing all seven astronauts, and the SARS virus spread across China causing hundreds of deaths. But one bright spot in a sea of misery was that a little film called Agent Cody Banks was released. What well, cheered me up? She good looking, got a mojo cooking, yeah, wouldn't give me the time of day. Directed by Harold Zwart and written by a group of people whose collective works include Ed Wood, Thor, X-Men First Class, and the remake of That Darn Cat? The film stars Frankie Muniz as Cody Banks, a 15-year-old who secretly works for the CIA as a junior agent. One day, he's called on by his handler, Ronica Miles, played by Angie Harmon, for a mission to befriend Natalie Connor, played by Hilary Duff, in order to get invited to find information on her father, who is building nanobots that can destroy any carbon or silicon objects. It's here he finds out about the evil Dr. Brinkman, played by Ian McShane, who is hoping to use those nanobots to take over the world. The movie was a decent hit at the box office, making about 59 million on a 28 million budget, reception from critics was more mixed, currently holding a 38% on Rotten Tomatoes. Personally, I liked it, although it is a little creepier than I remember. Every male character is horny as fuck, which makes some of the director's lines a little off-putting. His only contact with the outside world is through his daughter, Nat. I want to get close to this girl. Also, we first meet Ronica with her entering a locker room full of teenage boys and straight up sexually harassing them. I want to be in trouble. <laughs> and it's a movie where the CIA basically uses child labor to essentially emotionally manipulate a teenage girl. But despite that, I still enjoyed it. Now, yes, it's probably mostly nostalgia, but I do like the two leads, the spy gadgets are cool, and it's just a fun adventure. Plus, the soundtrack is pure early 2000s awesomeness. Whether you like it or not, there's one thing you can't deny. It has one of the most gruesome villain deaths ever put in a PG movie. Perfect family entertainment. Anyway, one year later, they made a sequel that I remember being incredibly disappointing. Released on March 12, 2004, Agent Cody Banks 2, Destination London, had a lot of changes from the first film. Gone were Hilary Duff and Angie Harmon. Gone was Zwart as director after he wanted more money for the effects, but MGM said no. Replacing him was Kevin Allen, and writing duties were mostly handled by one person, Don Reimer, whose career includes some decent films like Santa Claus 2, Rio, and Ferdinand, but also includes critical flops like Deck the Halls, Rio 2, and all three Big Mama's House movies. This film was not a hit, opening at number 5, only making around $29 million on a $26 million budget, and critical reception was far worse, currently sitting at 14% on Rotten Tomatoes, 32 on Metacritic, and 4.5 on IMDb. I remember renting this and thinking it wasn't nearly as good as the first one, but it has been 20 years, so let's see if Agent Cody Banks 2, Destination London, is as disappointing as I remember. So the movie starts as all family movies should, in Viet Goddamn Nam. Cody, played once again by Frankie Muniz, is doing some training exercises at camp. These exercises involve him physically attacking other kids. Again, this should be illegal. Also, why is he still in training camp? He saved the world. Shouldn't he be on a fast track to special agent? I know he's still a minor, but... When has that stopped you? The head of the camp is Victor Diaz, played by Keith Allen, who yells at him for being nice to his friends. Remember, kid. Trust nobody. Including me. Well, he's the bad guy. Gonna take a little while to be told that, even though he literally just told us. We're right here, if you need anything. You know us, USA first, Cody Banks second, then Mom and Apple Pie tied for third. Oh shit, I joined a cult. So, follow me on this. The kids are about to launch a satellite into space, but then over the loudspeakers, it announces a Code 42. Guys, Code 42 is Parents' Day. And this causes them to abort the mission and disguise the camp with admittedly a few cute jokes. But like, did they not know it was Parents' Day? Cody's parents arrive. They talk a little bit about the stock market because that's a thing kids care about. Hey, is that my video now? Huh? Okay, 2004. 
So later that night around the campfire... No, no, wait, sorry. I, I have to explain what the video now was for those of you who were too young. Okay. The video now was basically a portable DVD player, except it only played their specific disc called PVDs, and through the mid-2000s you could buy these discs in stores and they would have episodes of your favorite shows. But they could only play 30 minutes of video, the audio was terrible, they would skip if you did so much as tap the damn thing, and the video quality was three steps below 140p, with the first model only being in black and white. My brother, sister, and I each got one for Christmas one year, and we were excited. You have no idea how good you have it, kids. Be thankful. Anyway. So later that night around the campfire, Diaz continues telling us that he's evil. Right through the learning about America and her so-called friends who smile at your face while stabbing you in the back. Cody, we're taking you home tonight and you're never coming back. Well, that night they're invaded by someone, but Cody believes it to be a drill, with Diaz saying the main goal is to get him to safety. We get some lame gags and mediocre action, but Cody fulfills the mission. What about the other chopper? I'll take care of it! Good work, mate! Did I mention I'm the bad guy? Well, of course he is, and the head of the CIA, played by Keith David, arrives at camp to yell at him for listening to his camp counselor. That was no simulation. That was the real deal! So I guess the kids should have just trusted the strange helicopters invading their camp and not listened to the man who's been training them for weeks. Dumbass. He tells them of a secret storage facility under the camp. because no kid would be desperate enough to use the broken toilet, especially after taco night. Anyway, here's a scene with a beanie baby. These are no ordinary beanie babies. Watch. Uh, mm. uh, maybe they are ordinary beanie babies, come on. Well, that was a joke. So, what's the deal with Diaz? Diaz was in charge of a CIA mind control program designed to help with human learning. Diaz, however, was more interested in developing it to control people's minds in a bad way and we decided to abort the program. Diaz took the decision pretty bad. So, you put the obvious bad guy who wanted to do bad things with mind control in charge of children. And I thought using Nazis as spies was the craziest thing the CIA ever did. So Diaz stole the mind control software. Again, why did you put him right above where the software is? So now it's up to Cody. I'm not sure why, though. In the first movie, they need a teen to get close to Natalie so they could get info. I think the adults should be the ones handling this one. Well, they're putting Cody undercover as a prodigy clarinet player and sending him to a London music school owned by a man they believe is working with Diaz. Well, it's a good thing you play the clarinet. I don't play the clarinet. Your file says you were in a school band for three years. I, I fake playing the clarinet to meet girls. I'm not sure who's the bigger idiot in the car right now. So he arrives in London and meets his new handler to replace Ronica. This is Derek Bowman, played by Anthony Anderson. Now Anderson is one of those people who would be in a lot of movies in the mid-2000s. Kangaroo Jack, scary movie sequels, Transformers. Wait, really? Well, anyway, he can be funny, but without proper direction, he can also be incredibly annoying. And here... And to top it off, woo, I got the fattest system in all of London. He is incredibly annoying. We get the obligatory London scenery, which probably took up a decent portion of the movie's budget that Zwart wanted for the special effects that MDM told him he couldn't get. So turns out Derek is what they call a free agent. All right, look, man. I screwed up on another mission and they sent me to this little backwater to teach me a lesson, all right? All right, who did you kill? Also, your punishment is going to live in London just fucking around until they need you? If I screw up, I get fired. Cody tells them he can't play clarinet, which I guess this is their attempt to repeat the can't talk to a girl from the first movie. So they take him to a secret lab hidden inside a haunted attraction. I mean, that's a little creative, but also kind of dumb. And here he meets Neville and... I don't think I've ever hated a character so quickly as much as I hate Neville. <laughs> well, obviously not quite to that extent. It'll do the trick. <laughs> we 
sipping your dinner through a straw at the very least. <laughs> good, 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 good. Seems to be working. Come on. Pretty colours. Pretty colours. A little hot still. It's okay, don't worry. I dislike you with great intensity. So he gives him his gadgets. One is Mentos that explode when licked. Well, that's an easy way to get your jaw blown off. Reminds me of that candy cord in the Halloween episode of Totally Spies. We've turned your retainer into a personal listening device. Now, you manipulate the range, the volume, and intensity using your tongue. Or you could use an earpiece. There's also a pen grappling hook. They were gonna use a hairdryer, but Disney stole their idea the year before. So he goes to school and we get a stupid scene with a butler that I hate a lot. He meets flutist Emily Somers, played by Hannah Sparrett, who was apparently a member of the S Club 7 group. There's a bunch of other kids they try to make interesting, but they're not. The next several minutes are just dumb gags. One with Mentos that Cody thinks will explode despite them not being his. Then we see Derek as the chef, and I swear to God they gave us the punchline but not set up. There is no reason he needs to be the chef. So Cody sneaks off to spy on Diaz and Kensworth. This is basically a rehash of him spying on the bad guys during the birthday party from the first film, except that was not only suspenseful, but actually kind of creepy in how they describe their plan. Say, so what, what is that thing, by the way? Just the guidance system to a Russian SS-18 intercontinental ballistic missile. Congratulations. You've just given us the power to neutralize America's entire strategic arsenal. Here, what do they do to show off their mind control technology? Great, we can finally start that all dog rock band called the Rolling Bones. What the hell? So Diaz wants to use it on the American president, which it was 2004. I think you're going to want to go after the vice president since he's the one calling the shots. Oh, by the way, Derek sleeps with a blankie. Is that a blankie? What? You sleep with a blankie? It's not a blankie, it's a handkerchief. Laugh. Then this creepy girl enters Cody's room without his permission and watches and records him while he sleeps. Really creepy. The comedy is so bad. I'm not saying the first film was a comedic masterpiece, but at least there, when a joke didn't work, it would fail and move on. These are so awkward. So who's your favorite composer? My favorite. I mean, who's been your most influential? Well, uh, Heinz. Yeah, Heinz, you know, he's definitely been my biggest influence. And the first also didn't feel the need to put in a joke every single scene. Like, watch this. Why was that scene in the film? Oh, fart jokes aren't enough for you? How about piss jokes? Oh, sure, no problem, my guy. Oh, what the? Oh, ooh, hey. This is awful. These jokes are awful. All right, you know what? I finally get it. I finally get why I liked the first one and was disappointed with this one. Both this and the first film are technically kids' movies, but the first is made for older kids, 10 to 12. This one is aiming squarely for kids under 10. And since I was 11 in 2004, that means I was too old for it. There, mystery solved. So Cody sneaks into the lab where the bad guys are and sees that they're planning to get microchips disguised as teeth into the mouths of world leaders at the G7 summit. And to be fair, the scene where Cody escapes does have some actual suspense and some cool gadgets. This is what I wanted to see. Oh, by the way, the soundtrack isn't nearly as good as the first. He escapes, but the bad guys see him on the monitor. Oh noes! Well, better follow this up with Cody being forced to play the clarinet solo. Why didn't you guys tell him it plays by itself? Diaz spots him and he runs. Well, now you're wanted by the US and UK authorities. So we get our big action scene, which is where I'm betting about half the budget went. It's okay. There's some decent stuns, so though parts stretch the suspension of disbelief. Well, he's bleeding massively. Yeah, I'm sure a little moped could break through that. Alright, well that was certainly a 
series of images. Cody gets away from Diaz, but somehow gets arrested by the police despite many eyewitnesses. He's interrogated by Mr. Weasley, and the scene is mostly pointless as he's just let go. Turns out Emily is a member of MI6, and has been working this case for months. I care about this about as much as the movie does. And then Cody is immediately kidnapped, so that action scene and the arrest were pointless. So he's brought in and about to go through the mind control procedure. Thank you for the subtitles. You really think I'm an idiot, don't you? So Cody's under mind control now. This should be really creepy, but instead it's all played for laughs. <laughs> Cody! <laughs> What's he doing? Cody, stop it! Cody, stop it! <laughs> you know, the first movie was a PG bordering on PG-13. This is a PG that could easily be a G. Cody gets the CIA director into a bus so they can kidnap him. I have no idea how this mind control thing works. In one scene, they have to control him. Now it seems no one is. Okay, to be fair, there are two really funny moments here. I'm British intelligence. No, she's not. No wonder all the malls are empty. They got all you kids working undercover. I'm not a kid. That's good, but this is better. We have to get that microchip out of him. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Any other context, a grown man knocking out a teenager would be terrifying. They get the device out with an exploding Mentos, and they head off to save the world leaders from being mind controlled. This movie should be more interesting than it is. Derek wears something that I'm pretty sure makes this movie racist for having him wear. Somehow they've already got all six of the other country's leaders and now just need the president. How the hell did you kidnap six world leaders in a few hours? Well, they tell the other kids that they work for the CIA and MI6, but don't worry, it barely matters. The bad guys kidnap the president and... Well, the rest of the movie is just a bunch of fight scenes set to the band playing music. Derek gets kidnapped and mind controlled, but they save him. They save the president, save the CIA director, fight the bad guys with some awful action scenes. This entire climax is lame. Again, the first movie had explosions and stunts and helicopters, and it genuinely felt like the world would end if they failed. I don't care here. I'm pretty sure the world wouldn't do stupid things if the leaders said to do them. Yeah, I know this was after Iraq and Afghanistan, but he can't just make this guy supreme leader. Go and write that on your lunchbox. That was the single wussiest punch I've ever seen. I hope I have the pleasure of working with you again one day. When the hell was there any romantic tension between these two? Wait, isn't she technically an adult? She has her own office, she's played by a 22-year-old actress, and Cody is canonically 16. Oh wait, 16 is legal age of consent in UK. Okay, never mind. Derek is now head counselor, which honestly seems like a demotion. And we get a dumb little joke with Cody's little brother eating a Mentos. No, Alex, don't lick the Mentos. There's a lot no, of candy no, talk no, in here. Uh, we'll it. Oh. oh, relax. This kid survived being mutilated by a plane propeller. He'll survive this. Yeah, or at least as disappointing as I remember. This is the definition of a Rush sequel. The story is lame and contrived, the tone is much more childish, the action isn't nearly as good, and it's not funny. The actors are doing the best with what they got, and it has a few cool scenes of spy stuff. It's not one of the worst movies I've ever seen, but it's one of the biggest disappointments. There have been talks of another sequel and even a more adult animated series, but so far nothing has come from it. So for now, this is the final time we would see Cody Banks on the screen. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye.